10 untenable ways to make the Himalaya. We've um, Himalaya mountains here you see we're looking north there's the Gangetic Plain, high Himalaya, snow peaks, the fabulous uh, Tibetan Plateau. As I'm going to uh, show you in a sec, you know, my view, and I uh, haven't been really seriously contradicted, is that something like this extent of thick and crust and elevated uh, terrain hasn't been seen on the planet since the Grenville. So roughly in the last quarter of Earth history, you know, we're, we are fortunate to have arisen as a species at a time to be able to behold something this, uh, this spectacular. As I say, the, uh, the Himalayan mountains, the Tibetan plateau, its geology has inspired you know, virtually every model about the, the building of mountain ranges or plateaus or the decay of uh, these mountain ranges. Its uh, ultimate formation, we as general agreement, that is because until about 55, 60 million years ago, India was an island in the uh, Indian Ocean and it then plowed into the southern margin of Asia and has moved forward and somehow uh, built the, the Himalayan Tibetan orogenic system. Despite the fact that, you know, I have colleagues that are, oh, I'm looking at the, you know, Proterozoic of Norway, trying to understand the uh, Caledonides of uh, Great Britain and understand ancient origins. And I just can sort of sadly shake my head because here it is. We've got the seafloor magnetic anomalies. We know the path of India, right, over the last 60 million years and before. We have the geodesy in hand. We've got seismic imaging of the crust and uh, mantle lithosphere. Tomography below that, we can wander all over the plateau and do geological observations and make measurements and date rocks. And there is no agreement beyond really these two statements. And actually, <laughs> I think about it, there's a group there's a, that actually is advocating that the collision didn't begin until about 30, 35 million years ago. No, no, that's pretty much just me, actually. I know, I think. Uh, but, 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 you know, uh, people say, oh, what about the Pan-African? And actually, if you look in detail, at no point in time was there ever the, uh, you know, you, you look for granulite uh, terrains as a, as, a, as a proxy for crust that would have been 70, 80 kilometers thick. And uh, no, not at any one time, nothing like this uh, occurred then. So it's a bit ironic that, you know, this is the so-called greatest natural laboratory for understanding uh, orogeny and uh, you know we've as I said British geologists were climbing over these rocks in the uh, 1870s 1880s and actually making some very uh, important observations that you know we're still debating today uh, initially here's this famous prescient paper of Argonne 1924 this would be north and south here's uh, here's India and you can see that he has India under thrusting uh, the Himalaya. Here's the Kunlun range. Here's the Tarim, the Tenshan, and by gosh, you know, uh, you know, pretty pretty uh, amazing pre-plate tectonic uh, perception. But that's pretty much until the 1970s, 1980s. These models were largely just sort of schematic cartoons. Uh, then a series of uh, developments, you know, numerical developments, creating more and more sophisticated uh, models. Today, in fact, we have fully coupled thermochemical models that, uh, that engage both the, 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 the mantle and, and, and crust, and we can uh, evaluate the effects of climate in localizing deformation, things like that you've already heard about. And of course, the future has no, has no bounds. But um, you know, what I really want to drive home is that this is, this is a part of the world that basically inspires models uh, that we can squabble about, okay? And here's, this is not exhaustive, okay? This is simply starting with Argonne uh, all the way. In fact, we're going to talk in some detail about these, these two, but actually, you know, I'll, I will address virtually every one of these. I, as I don't mean to su suggest that this is the, the extent of it, but these are the ones that, uh, yeah. Just so I mean, in the twenties, I just never really was aware of that. But so there, the plates are moving forwards and back, but no plate at times. So how did that actually? People 
we're fine with that? Well, uh, you know, of course, uh, Continental Drift was popular in some quarters uh, at, at the time. And it was, you know, I mean, this has been the, the fundamental uh, puzzle of geologists, right? Which is that, geez, you know, that's a thrust fault. That means there was horizontal motion. And, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, well, you, of course, you know that the, the history of geophysics has been essentially, you know, the history of setting back Earth science. Uh, you know, tens of years. Uh, Alan, come on, engage me here. <laughs> <laughs> well, Starting with Kelvin. There's a lot of for that. <laughs> uh, Jeffries yeah. was at the time, you know, very influential. And uh, so, you know, Argand is a, he's a physician living in Paris and he eventually gives his practice up because he's, you know, uh, so engaged. And you can imagine that it would just be, it would be sort of the Sven Hedin accounts coming out of the early trips through the back, uh, backwoods of uh, Tibet. And actually that I mention it, uh, if you just hold that thought, that actually the Hadin expeditions have really inspired what's been the current debate, or the debate the last 30 years or so of, of uh, uh, distributed shortening, or the thin viscous sheet model it's called, versus uh, continental extrusion. We're gonna talk about that. That was actually inspired by the fact that in, uh, you know, at 1911, Sven Hedin and his group are wandering through the, uh, the mountains of, uh, of Tibet, and they notice, in fact, uh, Cretaceous ruddites. And they pick them up, but they're being chased by Kampa bandits, and they forget to wind their uh, chronometer, so they don't actually know. You know, they know their, their uh, latitude, but not their longitude. So this actually was inspirational in the sense that it then became sort of well agreed amongst Western geologists that, oh, there must have been, uh, Tibet must have been basically planed off below sea level, uh, uh, you know, 90 million years ago. Because, you know, everywhere <laughs> there's, uh, there's a marine fauna. And as it turns out, it's actually restricted to a fairly narrow uh, uh, a channel. But, uh, but, but this is, in fact, I mean, this is a great, this is the one origin because of, you know, the fact that post-war, Western geologists could wander all around the world except uh, you know, into the, the backwaters of, of Tibet and a few other places. So this is a case where actually numerical models got to the origin before basic geological observation. And in some respects, we've been suffering for it for the, for the last 30 years, that basically the modelers beat us to the outcrop and put into place concepts that sort of were so widely disseminated that it's really been hard to to, you know, with subsequent observation, beat them out of the, out of the literature. Okay, so, uh, le so what we're going to do, actually, in, in turn, is, is really talk about each one. And I'm not, you know, I've, I've, I'm a partisan, okay? I mean, I've, I've, I've made my observations, and I'm going to contribute to the problem as much as the next guy. But uh, what I thought I would do is give you, as objective as I can, an evaluation of these, these different uh, models. Uh, this one here, for the last 10 years, has swept the community like a wildfire. Uh, this, is, this is as close to religious observation as I've seen in, in the geosciences, the channel flow model. Um, and we'll talk a bit about that, I, which I don't think is tenable for reasons I'll, uh, I'll describe and, and get you guys to point out my, my block. With Nelson, it, it, is, it is actually directly inspired from, from the Nelson model, absolutely. Yep. Uh, but much modified since. There are some, uh, you know, untenable aspects that... Uh... Okay, so I'm going to focus mostly on the crustal thickening history, although ultimately, you know, what's Tibet doing up there? You know, this average elevation of five kilometers. Surely it has to have, you know, some, some involvement of the mantle as well. But Wang Ping's going to talk next week. He's going to focus on, uh, you know, seismic uh, imaging and, uh, and, uh, and the, the deep earth aspects of this. So I'm really going to restrict my, for the most part, you'll see a couple of cross sections, to, to crustal uh, thickening history and kind of artificially divorce uh, that uh, very important and, uh, and arguably dominant uh, el element from this. Okay, so these are what was the crustal structure of Tibet prior to collision, be it 35 or 60 million years ago. As I say, there was a, a school of thought that in fact it was everywhere thin. This inspired the so-called uh, thin viscous sheet model, came uh, out of uh, Cambridge in the late uh, 70s, early 80s. Phil, uh, uh, Phil England, uh, uh, Dan McKenzie, Greg Hausman, 
later Peter Molnar, uh, all uh, advocates of this point of view, which is simply that they, at the time, the numerical sort of state of the art, I guess Peter Berg was the originator of the, the thin viscous sheet. Basically a two and a half dimensional uh, model where you, you, you take an average uh, crustal strength, uh, lithospheric strength in the, the vertical dimension and then in this case apply an indenter, okay, numerically here and so what they saw was you know, as, as, as India here hits uh, the margin of southern Asia, you basically like plow up as a bulldozer the uh, crust in front of you. So here's one, two, three, four kilometers in elevation. And then they pointed out that, you know, this, this, looks, uh, this looks a good deal like the, the present topographic distribution of, uh, of uh, Tibet, southern Asia. The, um, in detail, uh, did was high elevation established first in the south and then uniformly propagated north. I think that that's no longer uh, uh, viewed as, uh, as uh, you know, consistent with the evidence. But this set off a 30-year debate because also in the early 80s, 1982, in fact, a variant of this appeared on the cover of geology. Uh, the so-called escape hypothesis. This is Tapinier and his co-workers doing a very simple experiment. This is pl plasticine. You see the stripes as a, as a strain marker and they push a rigid indenter into it. And uh, because of the nature of this material and the fact that there's a glass sheet over here, to uh, constrain it, um, in fact, it responds by breaking chunks and pushing stuff to the to the free boundary uh, over over here. And uh, this was Paul's uh, analog for what's uh, for in fact the extrusion of Indochina of Sundaland, which I'm going to show you in the, in the next slide. But just to point out that this really has, over the last 30 years. Uh, Broadly dominated the uh, you know in the background of every discussion you have about possible models to explain the origin, uh, you have partisans that say this is the most uh, this is the important thing. You need every last centimeter of the 2,500 or the 3,000 kilometers of convergence, depending on when you want to start collision. Right? You know where is India relative to the boundary of Southern Asia when collision begins? So if you think that that rudite that uh, Hadeen and his colleagues picked up is telling us that Tibet was planed off below sea, sea level 60 million years ago, you need every micron of that 2,500 kilometers of convergence in order to build a crust that is today 75 or 80 kilometers thick. If Tibet had locally some high topography or some elevation or in this uh, crustal thickness, then in fact, you actually have, can use some of that convergence to push chunks of it out of the way. Okay, okay the um, geologically, uh, what are the observations that the English geologists made 140 years ago uh, is this um, uh, paired granite belt that, you know, it's in many convergent margins. You, know, you look at the Andes and there's, you know, calcalkaline. You know, plutons and and uh, and and, uh, and volcanics uh, in a linear chain. The Himalaya is a little unusual in that there's two belts of pearluminous, these so-called S-type granites we mentioned the other day, who who referred to as pearluminous, that are offset by about 80 uh, kilometers, and they run parallel to the origin. And this is essentially unique in uh, in in origins. Uh, more recently. Uh, again, this is sort of swept like wildfire. The idea that it really matters which direction the rain comes from. Okay, you uh, you you have the Indian monsoon come up, hit the southern margin of this extraordinary uh, mountain plateau system. The rain, you know, where it washes sedimент, changes, you know, loads the uh, uh, the frontal uh, basins. That changes the state of stress and the deformation mechanisms. In fact, change as a response. To you know, if it had, if in fact the rain had come from the north, the plateau almost certainly would look a lot different than it does. Um, and lastly, and this is a puzzle that when Western geologists first arrived, the French started arriving in 1981-82. Um, the big puzzle was well, this is the textbook example of a convergent or orogeny, right? And uh, you know, this model this model in fact has been published before a Western geologist steps into southern Tibet. 
And the weird thing is that uh, although pre-collisional Cretaceous and older rocks in southern Tibet are highly deformed, there is a widespread uh, ignimbrite flare-up at around 60 million years. And everywhere in southern Tibet, those rocks are flat-lying and undeformed, essentially. So in fact, you know, the antithesis of, of, of this, that in fact, the only part of Tibet that doesn't seem to have deformed is the, the part that was adjacent to the collision. OK, so we're going to uh, cover, uh, cover these uh, models. Uh, let's start with what I already mentioned, the, the idea of uh, what became known as continental escape. Paul hates that term, he refers to it as a lateral extrusion model. But here's the idea that if you look at this map view of uh, Southeast Asia, you see India, the Himalayas, Tibet, and then Indochina, Sundaland here, uh, which in fact is bounded to the north by a now deformed uh, a fault that uh, Paul argued was the equivalent of one of those slices uh, in the analog model, right? You know, here's, here's Sundaland, and here's, uh, here's the Kunlun Fault up here, and here's, here's the Himalaya. So roughly speaking, uh, his argument is that Sundaland used to be here. Okay? And as India hit, it didn't produce uniform distributed deformation, starting by building a plateau in the south and having it propagate north. Instead, because of this you know, essentially stress-free boundary, over to the, uh, to the east. As India moved forward, Sundaland basically got pushed out of the way. And it wasn't until uh, you made hard collision, until that was uh, finished, that you began to lift up the uh, uh, Tibet and the, and the Himalaya. Uh, you know, one of the, the uh, early, earliest criticisms of the model was the fact that you see this has to have a left lateral sense of displacement. Right? Sundaland has to be moving here relative along the Red River Fault. And the fact is, the fault is active, but in a right lateral sense. But uh, nonetheless, Paul's hypothesis uh, was, look, we have the seafloor stripes out here in the South China Sea. The South China Sea uh, the ridge here is basically marking it, showing you a pull-apart basin. It is, in fact, the pull-apart connected okay, in this plate system, uh, the termination of the Red River Fault going into this more distributed deformation in uh, central Tibet. So in fact, as India's moved northward, we basically ripped ourselves some new oceanic crust between 34 and 16 million years. So Paul's, uh, Paul's hypothesis actually is uh, testable, okay? which, you know, frankly, when you look at the, <laughs> the scale of things, uh, you know, all we can really do is go on fishing trips, go and make some observations. So we're really still in the exploratory uh, phase. But here was a nicely posed problem, because you know if his hypothesis is uh, is uh, or some successful test would be, even though it's right lateral today, it has to have been left lateral during this this, this period. Uh, we can determine that there's been about 700 kilometers of uh, of opening, so we expect 700 kilometers slip along the left lateral slip along it. And if it's feasible, the, we should have evidence that this shear zone was active between about 34 and 16 million years. Okay? Does that, does that strike so far really line up with the, uh, is it one of the transform faults on the spring side? <laughs> you know, at, at this scale, yeah. In, in detail, uh, the, uh, this, is, this is a lot messier than um, and, and that's also been the subject of some. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, this thing hasn't been active for 16 million years, so there's a lot of sediment-bearing uh, 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 features. Uh, but by and large, I mean, the, the, the overall, the, the, the zeroth order, uh, as you'll see, uh, predictions have been, have been borne out. This is a lot of information crammed on the one slide. The first thing I want to point out is, here's Hanoi. Uh, Kunming would be about here. Oh, here's Kunming. And there's a series of massifs, the Denu Convoy in Vietnam, the Ilo Shan, okay? the Densing Shan, and the Zulong Shan. These are essentially fossil remains, in fact, and if you look at them in detail, of a left lateral slip. Okay? The kinematic indicators are that despite the fact that the active strike slip fault with a normal component is right lateral, 
Uh, this has probably only been going on for about the last eight million years or so, and that the dominant de deformation mechanism in these really highly deformed uh, anises uh, was, uh, was, was left lateral. There was a, a very fortunate uh, circumstance that uh, has allowed thermochronology, we talked about the other day, to, 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 uh, to address this question of the, the, the timing. And that is that if you look at the pole of rotation from, from the South China Sea, and I'll point out that the Red River Fault, in fact, you see this bend? This fault here is actually offset. If you restore that, what you find is the polar rotation isn't exactly coincident with the Red River Fault. It actually pr predicts, bec because of, of overlap, I think, let's see, the polar rotation looks like this relative to the fault. So it's predicting that there would be transpression up here and transtension down here. And indeed, uh, the Isle of Chan, the shear zone in the south, in fact, has been extended to the point where the uh, uh, the fabric in the rock is, is rotated almost, uh, almost horizontal. So uh, what you're looking at here is the timing in kilometers north of Hanoi of the passage of this transition from transpression to transtension because, in fact, what we can see in the argon, in the potassium feldspar multi-domain H spectra is we can see the onset of, of, of extension. And if you plot this for any particular uh, isotherm, let's take the 200 degrees, in fact, this uh, transition is propagating along the fault at about four centimeters a year. That's what you'd predict from the, the slip right from the South China Sea floor stripe. So that works pretty well. Only goes back, we lose the information at about 25 million years, but in fact, we can go in with an ion microprobe and use uranium thorium lead dating of garnets that are distributed in high grade rocks in the Danu convoy in the Iloshan. And what we find is garnets that have grown under left lateral deformation. And the age of these inclusions that uh, were forming is simultaneous with the, uh, the garnet formation are between about 25 and 32, 33 million years old. So we have evidence in the rock record of left lateral slip between, say, 32, 33 billion years and 25. At 25 million years, we have the argon record picks up uh, until, about, until about 16, 17 million years. So what do we got? We've got evidence, the same timing between about 32 and 17 million years, same magnitude of uh, slip, same magnitude of offset from paleomag. Now it says around 700 kilometers. You can imagine the errors are large, but they're within uncertainty of, uh, of the amount that you predict from the seafloor stripes in the South China Sea, and that in fact, uh, when this thing was active between 30, 32 and 16 million years, it was in a left lateral sense. So I'd have to say that this is the, you know, the one well-posed uh, problem that, uh, that's, that's, that's been addressed and uh, because of the success of this model, although you know the, the, the partisans with the thin viscous sheet model uh, you know haven't exactly uh, you know uh, heralded the, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the its triumph, um, it's in fact uh, led to a more generalized view, uh, model, which is that it isn't just Indochina that's experienced this mixture of uh, trans-tensional uh, and pressional uh, faulting coupled with intercontinental uh, subduction. Paul generalized this in 2002 to the entire plateau. And his argument, then we're looking south to north. Here's the Himalaya uh, in India. And what he argues essentially is that same mechanism, lateral extrusion coupled with intercontinental uh, uh, subduction, uh, and you know, uh, production of calcalkaline magnets, which you do see uh, on, on, on the plateau, is what led but, uh, to the growth of the plateau, again, propagating from south to north. And as I mentioned earlier, actually, as we look in detail, what we find is uh, that the earliest evidence of uh, crustal thickening isn't right at the, the suture, but rather it's in uh, the Kunlun Shan, the Nanshan, um, and, uh, and, and so on further north. So it's, it's a little puzzling. Okay, India hits here, 
And the first thing that happened is a mountain range goes up here. Okay, so we really don't understand some, uh, some aspects of this. Yeah, Alan. So, um, those local square columns don't always go on to get across. So it's all about avoiding. What do you mean because we're, we have the different, uh, different thicknesses of, of mantle? Well, you've got, yeah, you've got these slabs going down. And so your, your line line on the, on the top of the local square of the mantle was about roughly twice or three times the Okay, so, so that thickness doesn't balance with what was carried into it. Uh, well, I'm not. Well, I, I, I'm not going to. Of course, there's all kinds. There's, there's clearly uh, movement for a lot of erosion from the top. But I'm sorry, I actually failed to mention this. That in fact, Paul's argument as to why the plateau is so pl Tibet is flatter than Kansas. Okay, literally, there's more tilt to the state of Kansas than there is uh, across the plateau. His argument is that this transpressional uh, faulting essentially cuts off drainage and Tibet is flat because it's being internally drained. You have, so where you see, Alan, where you see uh, these thrust systems, he's not actually proposing that that material's transported out. It's basically, you know, it's getting filled into these it basins and that's what's um, keeping Tibet level. Uh, I'm, not a big, uh, I'm not a big fan of this model, despite the fact that I think he's nailed it with uh, uh, the, you know, Sundaland's uh, e extrusion, um, you know, and, and the, the principal reason is simply there is no clear evidence of northward propagation, and indeed, you know, what evidence there is suggests otherwise. Okay, now a little uh, tutorial before we take that. I mean, that was a relatively straightforward uh, uh, issue. It, it gets complicated now, and you need to know a little bit about the geology of the Himalaya. Okay, here's the, um, here's the Gangetic Plain down here, series of uh, thrust faults. This is the, this is the suture, separates true Asian rocks from uh, rocks of, uh, of Indian affinity. Uh, you only actually see the suture in a couple of locations. It's, it's already gone. When people uh, argue that, uh, as some do, that plate tectonics didn't begin until a billion years ago on the planet because you don't see Ophiolites, uh, rocks much older than that, or they're extremely rare. I point out that here you have 3,000 kilometers of uh, collision front, and uh, we actually only see Ophiolite in about 3%. So even before this origin stopped, the Ophiolites were either you know, buried or eroded or some other, uh, other, uh, other way terminated. So I don't see that as a particularly strong uh, uh, argument. Okay, there's a bunch of different rock packages, and I'm going to uh, put this up here so you guys have a, uh, you know, have a quick reference. From south to north, so here's the crest of the high Himalaya. Okay, this is the Indus Tsongpo suture. So this is the, this is the suture here between Indian rocks and, and Asian rocks. Uh, uh, yes? Oh, okay, 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 so let's, uh, okay, okay, this is the Indus Songpo suture, okay, this is a, uh, does that work? Black works? I was actually going to use black for the, uh, let me, let me, let me do this for the, for these uh, structures. This feature here is the South Tibetan Detachment, oops, sorry, the STD. Okay, and this is a curious feature, okay? The STD, yeah, again, despite the fact that this is the textbook compressional origin, there is a normal fault develops midway between uh, you know, collision and, 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 and present day. Uh, and it has the down to the north uh, sense. And, um, and of course, the, for the most part, the explanation is you, you build a, a mountain range up uh, high enough, in fact, it becomes gravitationally unstable, and this is basically just you know, sliding off the, uh, the roof of the world here. There's a fault here called the main central thrust, okay? and this is the big guy. This is the one here that really is responsible for 85% or something like that of, uh, of, of crustal thickening in the uh, and then the guy down here is the main boundary front fall, uh, thrust. 
And actually, there's another one, the main, main frontal thrust. We don't need to worry about that. What I wanted to do, though, is to then define these rock packages. As you look at the Himalaya, between the South Tibetan detachment and the suture, this is the Tethian Himalayan series. So I'm going to call that the THS, OK? So that's the Tethys. And that's basically you know, the goo that formed on the leading edge of India prior to its collision. So this is the, the uh, deep sea uh, sediment, for the most part, on the, uh, on the leading edge of India that uh, was the first to, in fact, experience interaction with the margin of southern Asia. Okay. Between the MCT and the STD, there's the greater Himalayan sequence. And this is in yellow. And these are very high grade rocks. These are amphibolite and then locally uh, granulite uh, uh, grade rocks. This is, um, again, a, 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 a more proximal uh, sedimentary uh, uh, package from, uh, from India that's been stacked up to make the, uh, the Himalaya. Unfortunately, it's also, what do we call it here? Here we're, in fact, yeah, it's called the GHC, the Greater Himalayan Crystallines, also known as the Higher Himalayan Series, okay? So uh, maybe I'll put that in, Higher Himalayan, okay? And then the Lesser Himalaya, LHS, that's these rocks in green, and then it really doesn't matter what's, uh, what's, what's down here. So we can think of this as Tibet, across the, uh, the suture, and then these various uh, distinctive rock packages. Now, if you look at the Himalaya, these blobs in red are uh, leucogranites. They're these pearly. These, these, are, these are granites that appear to have melted, not, okay, not from uh, you know, a good Andean type of, uh, of, of protolith, but rather they appear to, in fact, have melted from shaley rocks, from perluminous uh, 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 origin. And there's a belt that runs right along the crest of the high Himalaya. So this would be the snow-capped peaks you saw in the first slide. And there's some biggies. There's uh, Manislu there. And to the north, about 60, 80 kilometers, there's a second belt called the North Himalayan Granites. Okay. So that's the first of these petrogenetic puzzles of the, the Himalaya. What's, uh, what's the origin of this belt? And it's going to have to be a pretty we, we could imagine that the, that the answer to this question is pretty specific because I, I frankly challenge any of you to tell me where else on the planet is preserved two parallel belts of perluminous rocks like, uh, like this. So this is kind of unique. OK. Let's have. Um, yeah, these are basically, uh, these are, as I say, more uh, proximal uh, sedimentary package. Uh, the GHS is characterized, if you, if you will, from a geochemist's point of view. Uh, epsilon neodymium here is about 14. Here, the, it's, uh, it's largely dirty uh, sandstones, uh, not, not very, uh, you know, not very, uh, there's uh, some, some uh, calc silicate and, uh, and some Pan-African igneous rock, but that's about it. Basically dirty quartzite. Okay, L L LHS, there are shaley rocks, carbonate rocks in here. Epsilon neodymium is, um, sorry, I said 14. I meant minus 14. Here, about minus 24. So in a sense, these are Im Im implicitly younger sediments than this package. So if here's India, the, the Tethys would have been here. There would have then been this shelf. Here's the greater Himalayan protolith, and then the lesser Himalayan. And these things have now been stacked up as a result of the uh, collision and subsequent convergence. Good, thanks. OK, so uh, part of understanding the, this Luca granite belt problem is the fact that it's only been relatively recently, about the last well, 10, 12 years, that we've actually been able to determine the, the age relations because these perluminous, these S-type rocks, they don't like to dissolve the minerals that we love to use to date the age of granites. For example, uranium, thorium, lead dating of zircon or monazite, things like this. The solubility of uh, monazite or zircon, these accessory phases, in crustal melts is vanishingly small. 
So the problem is, back in the old days when you used to like to collect a gram of zircon and then dissolve it and put it in your mass spectrometer, imagine this case here. Here's a monazite grain from Manislu. That's in fact, I think I pointed out, that's this guy right here. And he is 22 million years old, okay? So now we have a device, an ion microprobe. I mentioned the other day, we can go in and we, and you can see the problem. There's a core that goes back to, in fact, Pan-African ages. What's the, if I were to dissolve this, what's the age I'd get? Uh, okay, 58 million years with very high precision, okay? But um, it wasn't until we were able to do in situ uh, dating that uh, we re recognized that the high Himalayan leucogranites, the ones that are along the snowy crest, they're 24 to 19. Those ones, the North Himalayan leucogranites, the belt further north, Oh, you know, they can be, they can, little bits can get that old, but for the most part, they're, they're younger. Uh, these appear to be uh, well, virtually minimum melts, or at least derived from uh, uh, muscovite dehydration, uh, melting. They're syn tectonic dikes and silicon. These are more like diapyric plutons. So let me show you sort of the, you know, artist's conception here. So the high Himalayan leucogranites, these are sort of dikes and sills. They're deformed. They are parallel adjacent to above and below the South Tibetan detachment system, mostly below. And here's the sort of more diapyric, seemingly higher temperature. Why higher temperature? Because they have less inheritance. The hotter a magma, the more accessory mineral you can dissolve. Okay, we're still calling them the greater Himalayan crystallines here in yellow. Now this also shows the, uh, the second petrological uh, feature, which is the so-called classic inverted metamorphism. Let's actually blow this up, okay? So there's the South Tibetan detachment. Here's the main central thrust. Here's the main, and you'll notice that as you, in fact, well, I can, let's blow this area up here. As you go from seemingly structurally uh, low positions, right? And you walk, you know, up section in the Himalaya, you go from zeolite grade to chlorite grade to biotite grade to garnet grade, okay? You see what's happening? All of you have done undergraduate petrology, I, 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 I suspect. We're going from essentially dirt grade rocks up to, you know, second sulaminite uh, isograd. And this was, uh, say, ge English geologists re recognized this in the 1870s and were puzzled by it. Uh, and interesting that um, in those days, uh, a rock that was, uh, you know, at uh, amphibolite or granulite grade was uh, Archean. Okay, uh, high grade rock was an old rock. So that's what was puzzling to them, uh, which is you had you know, old rocks on top of young rocks. Well, that you know, obviously hasn't stood the test of time, but nonetheless, it was, it, 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 it's, it's plain. Uh, in the uh, 1970s, 1980s, first actually inspired by uh, Patrick Lafour and then quantitatively by Phil England and Peter Molnar, they focused on the fact that the main central thrust, which I say is the locus of most of the, the action in the, in the, in the Himalaya, uh, is, is responsible, in fact, for creating heat during slip that would have flowed laterally into these lower grade down going, going rocks. So that, um, that inspired a whole bunch of models. Is that clear? Anybody got any questions about that? Yeah. I'm not sure they knew that in 1870. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, actually in Musori, where this was first observed, there would have been no access to that. I think that's an observation that would have come later. Yeah. Um, Uh, sorry, yes, yes, this is the ITS, right. You'll notice, as I mentioned, that the ophiolite's pretty much gone in most uh, locations. This is the Renbu Zedong thrust. This is a back thrust that basically has, uh, you know, chewed up uh, evidence of the, uh, of the original suture. So this, re relative, this is between maybe about 15 and 9 million years, this motion here has basically. And in fact, this is the Gangdizi thrust. Again, you only see the Gangdizi thrust in the whole collision zone in a, exposed about over about 100, 120 kilometers. 
and simply because the RZT backs off there and this thing gets exposed at the surface. And this was important in thickening the thickening southern Tibet. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, so RZT, this slide. And actually also it's now called the great counter thrust because that was in fact the original uh, description of that back thrust from uh, uh, Adolfo Ganser's uh, work in the 1920s and 30s. Yeah. Which ones are the lucogranites? These are lucogranites and these are lucogranites. They're all lucogranites. Which ones are the high Himalayan? Sorry, these are the North Himalayan. These are the High Himalayan. Yeah. Yeah, I get your point. <laughs> Thank you. Anything else? I, I, uh, no, no, no. They, it, it, we'll, 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 we're going to talk about this in detail, and I better get moving. In fact, this, in fact, the the the, the thought is that the greater Himalayan sequence, these high-grade rocks, in fact, were once molten Tibetan lower crust. And I really did need to boot this. So uh, yeah, okay. The, 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 the problem is when we did develop these in situ uh, dating methods, what we found is, it's sure, that the rocks in the hanging wall, these were all deformed and melted 22, 24, 19, 23 million years, but the recrystallization down here, in fact, we have excellent evidence. For example, here's a garnet that we know from, you know, petrological PT uh, methodology grew at uh, a depth of about 25 to 30 kilometers. But in fact, the inclusions that grew synchronous with that garnet formation, they're eight, seven, six, five, four, even three million years old. So this was a gigantic red herring, right? It sure looked for the world like, oh, hot rocks, fault, cold rocks, frictional heating, lateral flow. But in fact, the recrystallization down here has nothing to do. These rocks were dead cold when, uh, when the, the recrystallization occurred in the footwall, okay? Okay, so now let's, uh, I showed you these models earlier. Let's, there's four types of models for the inverted metamorphism in Texas. I mentioned to you the Lafora model, which focused on the MCT, basically the hot iron model. You bring uh, hot rocks and you have uh, substantial shear heating on the MCT, and you're going to create the sawtooth geotherm adjacent to fault. Heat will flow to the foot wall, and that's why the metamorphic grade decreases. Uh, another one Wiki Royden and her colleagues developed was that here's the main central thrust. Basically you have accretion and actually that's a pretty good idea that you have rocks from uh, the lower plate accreting into the into the upper plate and because these uh, uh, lesser Himalayan rocks are very radioactive uh, over time over tens of millions of years you can melt those rocks because of the, the high uh, and I'm going to show you. Now, here's Peter Bird's original model, Bird 78. This is his idea was, oh, look, you have these melt North Himalayan granites and these high Himalayan granites simply because the, uh, the mantle lithosphere, uh, what did he call it, delaminated, okay? And the asthenosphere came up to the base of the crust and produced this melting. I'm not going to talk about this further. This, in fact, you know, uh, is unlikely to create perluminous uh, melts. And do we know, as Wang Ping will tell you next week, uh, this is inconsistent with the uh, seismic imaging. Uh, the Nelson model, Alan's already uh, alluded to this. Doug Nelson is a result of uh, a uh, seismic uh, survey in southern Tibet proposed that the greater Himalayan sequence, here's the STD, here's the MCT, that's these guys here, the greater Himalayan sequence, actually originated uh, as partial, uh, partially molten rocks and basically got squeezed out like a watermelon might uh, between your, your fingers. And we're going to talk a lot about that because that's been very influential. Another is the, the Lafour model, as I'll mention, kind of died a natural death when Nigel Harris and his co-workers pointed out that the chemistry of these high Himalayan leucogranite rocks is absolutely inconsistent with their formation in water-saturated melting. The Lafour model, you take these hydrous, these water-rich, low-grade rocks, you thrust them with a you know, high degree of shear heating, the MCT, hot hanging well rocks, the heat gets transferred, you dehydrate, and water gets fluxed across and it causes minimum melting in the hanging wall, except that, in fact, these are 
all produced essentially uh, by fluid absent uh, reactions. So Nigel's point is like, well, wait a minute. What about good old decompression melting? If, uh, if you have uh, the STD, if you have this normal fault, you can take a rock, right, that's initially, right, above the solidus, drop 10, 15 kilometers off it, produce some melt. That's how you're going to. And we're going to come back and talk about these in turn. Type 4, uh, inverted metamorphism is due to the transposition of right way up metamorphic sequences. Uh, you can do it ductally. Mike borrowed this from an Italian uh, worker. Uh, here's Mary Hubbard's model, which, uh, which inspired, uh, you know, our, or led to, uh, 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 you know, our, uh, our model I'm going to introduce you to a little later. And that is simply that it's all just a giant, you know, it's a terrible mistake. It's, uh, you know, a red herring that <coughs> you had a single right way up metamorphic sequence. And what's happened is it's been juxtaposed, the strain so high that the isograds have been rotated essentially into parallelism with the shear zone boundary. So as you walk through the Himalaya today, it sure looks like you're going from low grade to high grade, and you are, but it's simply because you've got this tectonically accordion uh, section through the shear zone. And to, to some degree, this is actually, and then actually uh, in the mid 90s, uh, Jameson Beaumont uh, pointing out that maybe this is because, in fact, you know, this isn't just fault bend fold tectonics. Maybe there's fluid motion allowing material that starts at different positions to flow and be juxtaposed. Uh, and this ultimately led to uh, the, uh, the channel flow model. I'm going to talk a lot about if I don't, uh, if I can get through this quick. Okay, so again, the Lafour model, uh, not successful because. It assumes that, that uh, inverted metamorphism and hanging well in Texas are temporally related, and they're not. This was hot 24 million years ago. This didn't recrystallize until 8 to 3. That's dead cold at that time. Uh, <coughs> the uh, quantitative efforts to, to model this, in fact, uh, England and Molnar wrote a sequence of, I think, four papers over about 15 years uh, in, order to, in order to make it work, in order to, because, this is the worst place in the world to make granite, right? You've taken these ice cold lower plate rocks and you're refrigerating the. So they ended up having, in order to meet the observation, they had to put 10 kilobars of uh, a shear strength on the rocks as they melted. And it's a wonderful paper, actually. I'd recommend it to you because, um, it, you know, again, this is sort of the, the long standing. Uh, tension between geophysicists and geologists. Because this paper, which actually makes what I think is an absolutely preposterous suggestion that these rocks could have 10 kilobars of strength at, at uh, anatectic temperatures, because uh, the, the introduction has is, is there's very much the English schoolmaster, sort of like, now you stupid geologists, we're going to tell you this one more time, OK? Um, oh, they weren't talking to me. <laughs> um, so let's see. Oh, assumes water saturated melting. And again, that's absolutely clear that 98% of these things are uh, vapor absent. And uh, then again, it just required absurdly high uh, uh, shear stress. So in fact, when we finally recognized that these two things, the inverted metamorphism and the antics weren't temporally related, that just made it all simple. Uh, the Royden model uh, actually uh, 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 kind of took leadership. This is a good idea, only in this case, um, it, it doesn't work. I mean, her, her model, because of its simplicity, predicts that there should be, you know, five more Bay of Bengal uh, sedimentary uh, de de deposits. Uh, but again, you know, you could modify this model to, to relax that, uh, that uh, problem. Uh, in predicts the Himalayan exposure too deep. Again, modifying the model would fix that. Um, I won't even tell you what that is. Inconsistent, yeah, but I mean, mostly important is, Though the footwall rocks, as I mentioned to you, they're isotopically. Here's the lesser Himalaya, here's the higher Himalaya, okay? You don't keep the higher Himalaya in this restricted epsilon neodymium, epsilon strontium space by, in fact, taking these rocks and pushing them up here and, 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 and getting them uh, commingled. That's, that, that clearly didn't happen. Uh, yeah, just uh, this is simply the difference in parts of 10 to the 4 between bulk earth, what the bulk earth would be today, and the, the measurement. So essentially, 
because when you melt the mantle, the mantle you know, preferentially uh, likes uh, the, uh, the daughter product relative to the, uh, uh, sorry, it likes the parent relative to the daughter product. Mantle rocks are going to plot up here. Continental rocks are going to plot down here. And old, very old continental rocks will plot progressively lower. So the sooner you separate it from the mantle, the sooner you're going to be a, a, a whole lot deficient in the, in the radiogenic daughter product relative to what the, as Sue says, if you put the entire planet into a giant mortar and pestle and crushed it up, it would have that composition today there. So where does Tibet sit? Uh, Tibet is complicated because uh, we, uh, uh, unlike the Himalaya, where we're really getting a pretty good vertical section, we're looking at surface rocks. And, uh, and in fact, uh, you know, the, it's complicated, but it c Tibet can plot here, 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 or here. Depends. Remember, before Triassic rifting, the Himalayan basement and the Lhasa block were sitting adjacent to each other. So what's happened since the Triassic is the Himalaya, you know, India went away for, you know, 200 uh, million years, and boom, it came back, and for the looks of it, uh, just about, you know, you know, found found its original docking location pretty pretty accurately. And there is no xenolith to look at deeper a little bit somewhere. Uh, there is in uh, not not in the Lhasa block. Further north there are, um, and uh, and they have all the problems that xenoliths have, which is you know that you you don't you know the, the felsic compositions are unlikely to be preserved because you put a felsic rock in a 1,200 degree basalt, it's less likely to survive than a you know. Mafic granulite. Okay, the um, Helmholtz anatex is due to decompression melting. Uh, the problem here is, you you really get one shot. You're going to need you're going to need about 15 or 20 kilometers of removal of overburden to get you 10, 15 percent partial melting. Okay, but now how do you, in fact, at say let's say at 24 million years, how do you then do it again at 17 million years? So the, the main problem here is it requires extremely rapid and large magnitude denudation. And it's hard to produce multiple anatectic uh, events. And lastly, this is not a killer, but uh, the, what we think we know about the timing of movement on the STDS is inconsistent, at, the, at least, with uh, the knowledge of the timing of these uh, granitoids. OK, now we get to Tibet and Mid-Cross to be partially molten, region between the MCT and STD, an early extruded equivalent. So here's the greater Himalayan. We're walking up section into these high-grade rocks. In fact, this isn't simply that we had these sedimentary packages right, that, in fact, arrived at the collision zone you know, at different, different times and then got stacked up in a fault bend fold type uh, uh, mechanism. No, rather, these things got shoved um, uh, into uh, uh, southern Tibet, or in fact, it's simply southern Tibet mid-crust melted and then got, uh, got, got pressed. Basically, you had this high plateau pushing down on this, and up she goes. Uh, this was a result of, in fact, some uh, imaging that uh, Nelson and his colleagues did with in-depth one and two through this rift. I showed you this the other day. Remember, this is where I was standing, taking that nice shot of the, of the detachment fault on the bounding of the Nenshang Tengla. Uh, Sean? Uh, the, the, the greater Himalayan is about two, two and a half microwatts per cubic meter. It's actually pretty radiogenic. Yeah. The Tethian is 0 0.4, 0 0.6 or something like that. So it's a big contrast. Okay, so this idea of sort of channelized flow, it took off like uh, a skyrocket. Uh, within just a couple of years, you have, you know, leading figures in the field you know, swearing allegiance to this idea that, uh, and here's a cartoon from, uh, from Searle's paper, yeah, that in fact, uh, you know, ba basically relatively, sh you know, middle, mid crust in, in Tibet. Here's the Gangdesi batholith. That's the Andean uh, marginal batholith. Here's the Indus Sutra. That's the, what I'm calling the ITS, okay? Uh, and basically the granites, the high Himalayan rocks here and the North Himalayan granites here, they're just variants of Tibetan uh, middle crust that's been extruded out. So you guys, I say, you can read this faster than I can uh, say it, but you get the idea. And here is even suggestions that it came from 200 kilometers north of the, the Himalaya. 
There's some problems with this. Here's the Yan Bai Zheng, here's that rift again. The last figure I showed you, the picture I showed you the other day, is looking to the northwest. Uh, now we're looking to the uh, southeast. In fact, the, 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 the rift is characterized. If you go to Lhasa to a hotel, you turn the light switch on, uh, odds are the electricity that generated that, uh, that power came from uh, this, uh, these field, uh, power plants out in the, uh, the, the geothermal field. Um, and even, you know, members of the in-depth uh, group uh, pointed out that uh, these uh, bright spot anomalies that were interpreted to be migmatite, partial melt, could equally well or might in fact better be explained as having the, the velocity properties of aqueous fluids. And that makes sense because, I mean, there's, <laughs> there's hot water there. There's, there's, uh, so, uh, Yeah, the, the argument has evolved over the years. Initially, uh, this, they, they, they were in some conflict with, with each other. And later, uh, it got more nuanced. And it's like, well, yes, but uh, why, are these, why are these fluids hot? Okay, it's because of, because of melting. Well, that's probably not uh, sustainable because when you actually grab some of this steam that's coming out and you measure the, the neon isotopes, don't have time to go into this in detail, but what you find actually is <clears throat> instead of, if this were truly intercrustal melts, you'd want to be, you'd, you'd anticipate that in fact you're, uh, uh, you know, you're going to have basically pure helium-4, okay? Uh, uranium, uh, thorium uh, uh, produced daughter product that dominates uh, crustal helium. <clears throat> instead, we're seeing somewhere between 1 and 5 percent of a mantle component. <clears throat> so it seemed to me the reasonable uh, inference here is you've got you know a pretty good rift. I mean, if you were to if you were to image the Socorro uh, mid-crustal magma body, um, you know at 15 kilometers underneath uh, Socorro, and then say, oh, um, this is because uh, North America is everywhere melted, uh, you know at uh, 15 to to 18 kilometers depth. Um, I think you would be greeted with some skepticism, and that it rather, you know, maybe that's a neutrally buoyant, uh, you know, basalt uh, magma that's that's ponded down there and is driving this hydrothermal system, and we're actually seeing uh, that uh, that that mantle signature. Uh, further, now, Wang Ping is going to tell you more about this, but the, <clears throat> the wild thing is, the well, Moho. This is complicated. I'm, I'm oversimplifying, but. Uh, there are, in fact, I guess this is uh, early, uh, some of your early work. Uh, there are uh, earthquakes with a focus of, uh, of 80, 80, 85, 90 kilometers depth uh, under southern Tibet, actually, in fact, adjacent, uh, adjacent this, this rift. And it's implying that the, you know, the deep crust of the Moho is relatively is cool, or at least relatively cool, compared to um, the sort of temperatures you'd need to generate this migmatite. I mean, these rocks in the greater Himalaya, if they originated uh, down, down here, relatively, you know, at 15 kilometers depth or something, uh, they would have to be temperatures equal to or greater than 750 degrees. So this is going to require a very odd thermal structure. And, uh, but in fact, uh, Chris Beaumont and his co-workers uh, actually pursued that. I'll show you that. Now, remember, here's the uh, Nencheng Teng Lashan again. Here's the rift floor. We can look up, we can actually walk up these valleys and we can see what the crust at 10, 15 kilometers looked like before rifting started 8, 10 million years ago. And in fact, there's no evidence for uh, migmatite down there. There are uh, hot, very hot calcalkaline uh, uh, granites down there. Some of them get as young as about 8, 9 mil million years. But essentially, when we have a chance, I mean, nature has, has in fact, you know, uh, we didn't have to drill down to 15 kilometers. We actually have an oblique crustal section, and it doesn't look like what uh, what Doug had uh, had envisioned. And lastly, if here we are, here's the Nencheng Tenglashan, the Yan Bajin Graben. If we're going to take a rock from here and extrude it through the Gangdesi belt, this is the Andean batholith. Okay, the Andean batholith has ages between about 140 and uh, and uh, 40 million years, you would expect, I think, that uh, you know, to extrude it from here to here, that you're going to have to go through that Andean batholith, which actually is active virtually right till today. But in fact, <coughs> the detrital zircon H spectra 
of the of the Himalaya, and of course, there's since then there's been triple this this work done. Nobody's found a zircon in the Greater Himalaya less than 500 million years. So I think it's 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 th this is not uh, supportive of the view that you've basically taken Tibetan middle crust and uh, extruded it through the uh, the Andean margin. The uh, shallow inner Texas model got a boost uh, right after Doug uh, proposed it. Uh, from modeling of uh, Henri, Le Pichon, and others, uh, showing that, in fact, if you had sort of steady state uh, <coughs> thrusting with this high uh, radioactivity, 2.5 microwatts per cubic meter, that, in fact, looks where's the 750 degree isotherm? Okay, it's sort of like, yeah, you could bring that up to about 15 kilometers depth. But again, uh, you know, the idea of uh, that what this predicts is that the surface, you know, above north of the main central thrust, we should be seeing granulate grade rocks for 200 kilometers to the north. And in fact, we don't. Uh, <coughs> you, you go across the MCT, there's the Tethys. Okay? And here you see, here's the great counter thrust, the Rinbu Zedong thrust. This is, the, I say, that you know, mud that formed in the northern margin of India over good Andean uh, granitoid uh, rocks. It's up here. Um, this stuff is, in fact, relatively low radiogenic. When you put the Tethian lid, as uh, Copeland et al. did in 2003, back on the system, look, the 750 degree isotherm okay, drops back down to about 30, 35 kilometers depth where, where it belongs. Okay? Well, that's, um, that's where it stood until about 2000. And then Chris Beaumont published this very influential paper in, in Nature. And his view was, uh, <coughs> you don't want to do this entirely by you know, piling thick radiogenic uh, crust. Um, you, could, uh, you, in fact, could underthrust Indian crust way into the Tibetan plateau and have it just stew there for tens of millions of years. Uh, and so, you know, sure, there's a little radiogenic uh, uh, kick, but also, in fact, you know, this is a, a nice place to, uh, to uh, uh, it's an insulating region. You build up some, uh, some <coughs> background heat flow. This material recognizes that there's a kind of a potential for an aneurysm here, that in the front of the high Himalaya, if you could restrict uh, precipitation, if you could restrict erosion to a very narrow region, what could happen is, okay, as this thing develops, you've got this molten crust you erode here, and this fluid material under high pressure, under the load of this kilometer, five kilometer high plateau, in fact, is going to squirt up. And that's the origin of the greater Himalayan uh, uh, sequence. OK? Real quick, the bottom of the diagram, what thermal profile would you expect for that? You are flowing relatively cool ah. yellow stuff under there. Why don't I show you? OK, uh, I'm going to run this th a few times. First off, here's India in green, and Tibet is in, is in brown. OK, we're going to run this through. We're going to see, actually, we can follow some particle paths. That's going to help. OK, so here's India. Notice that originally, the isotherms are, are horizontal. So they're going to start the, uh, they're going to start the uh, instead of having a steady state convergent margin thermal profile, they're going to start with uh, uh, somewhat, higher, uh, somewhat higher temperatures. So. <clears throat> Here's, uh, here's material in Tibet. Look at this guy here in black. It sort of moves south and then kind of stagnates, gets into this partially molten region that's red. OK. Now let's follow some material on the south of the suture. Here's a guy goes down, sort of dwells. It's getting hot. Oh, and he's, in fact, at the leading edge of this. And here comes that channel up here. Notice that there's no erosion. We're going to start this, uh, and there's no erosion until, oh, about 25 million years into this. So this is an important aspect of the model, is that you have to, in fact, push material deep into the Tibetan crust, let it stew, and then the, 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 the drop the flag and the erosion starts. So as I said, this is a good one here. Notice uh, this guy goes down on his way back. But you see the magenta circle? It doesn't make it as far. It comes back. That's great, because that's going to explain the inverted metamorphism, right? This guy goes down, comes up, watch this guy. So they're going to be juxtaposed very close at the Earth's surface, but they've got very different particle paths. And in fact, it predicts 
uh, PT loops, PT histories, that are broadly similar, although in detail uh, not the same as, uh, as what you'd predict from uh, sort of a fault bend fold type history. Okay, you seen that enough? Uh, 32 free parameters. Yeah, basically, yeah, right, it doesn't rain for 25 million years, and then, then it gets turned on. Okay, it does a bunch of things well. It actually does, broadly, fits the first order metamorphic petrology observations in the Himalaya pretty well. Um, <coughs> the, uh, predicts the ages that we'd see, the ages of garnets. Uh, uh, predicts the age distribution of two granite belts. The general form of the PT loops, although in fact it, it really it really f uh, fails at, at, in the in the end analysis, and you know mid crustal of Texas, um, you know the erosion history, uh, you know that's it's a matter of opinion. Uh, it's unrealistic thermal history. Basically, you know instead of starting with a steady state convergent uh, history, um, uh, but this is the I'll, I'll skip to the chase because I'm I'm running out of time I think here. Yeah. Oh boy. Inconsistent with the nap phase, and by that I simply mean that if you see the model, if you look at the, right, it's showing this sort of this narrow orifice. So not only do you have to delay onset of precipitation, and then, you know, but you can't, you can't have this as a 200 kilometer wide nap phase being, being in place. The model only works if you have this narrow orifice. In fact, the, his cross section of the Himalaya is taken here, okay? And notice that the greater Himalaya or only, in fact, in places the structural thickness is only about six, seven kilometers. But any other arbitrary section you'd make, you'd actually see that the greater Himalayan is this, you know, big thick nap that, in fact, in most cases has had to slide across, you know, the, the Nepali jungles <laughs> uh, um, for, uh, you know, 100, 120 uh, kilometers, something like that. So this, to me, is the is the the principal. Uh, um, problem with, with, with this model is that, you know, it would be great if everywhere the greater Himalaya was this little thin aneurysm that had poked up, but in fact it really uh, doesn't explain. We, um, both, uh, simultaneously, we, um, uh, we, actually a little earlier, we um, started fiddling with uh, <laughs> the idea of actually doing the same thing, of forestalling uh, erosion, basically thickening uh, Tibet, and then um, juxtaposing just by, you know, conventional uh, thrust tectonics, uh, juxtaposing uh, the uh, metamorphic uh, distribution that was produced across a narrow shear zone, although in detail, in fact, uh, you know, this my narrow shear zone actually could be, um, you know, a duplex formation. That, uh, I saw that as sort of the central abstraction was a lot of action happening across a relatively narrow region, and uh, we characterized it as by out of sequence thrusting, um, but we're probably we're probably not entirely correct there. So here is the model essentially: you have 25 million years of uh, of crustal thickening in which you know not much is happening and it ain't raining either. Okay, uh, then you know the MCT breaks, and the advantage there is you've got this material, the base of which. Uh, is maybe only 10 or 15 degrees from, uh, you know, uh, vapor absent melting equilibrium of, from say, something like muscovite. So a relatively minor, we don't need 10 kilobars, 200 bars of shear stress is enough shear heating to kick you over the solidus and produce the high Himalayan liquid granites. Okay? And then as a result of, well, frankly, a bit of a Rube Goldberg sort of series of, uh, of um, out of sequence thrusts, we in fact can uh, add, you know, reproduce. Here's our model results. This is the age of those monazite inclusions in the garnet. And you know, the model actually predicts the yellow and with the observations are shown in these various colors. <coughs> here's the hanging wall. Here's the, uh, the, the shear zone. Uh, across the, the, the MCT, and you know, I mean, it, it matches because we made it match. This is not a thermal mechanical model, it's a thermal kinematic model. I said, then we're going to arbitrarily 
simply break a, a fault here, and that's what's going to juxtapose these different ages. But it works. But the main thing is that it actually predicts the onset of the two granite belts. You have melting. So here's, we can think of this cumulative melt fraction distance from the boundary. After one million years, we've got melting in the location where we see the high Himalayan liquid granites. But there's a, uh, there's a, a delay because the melting in the North Himalayan granites is in fact due to, uh, due to uh, biotite dehydration melting. And you know, without much tuning, we managed to get the appropriate age contrast between the more southerly high Himalayan granites and the northerly North Himalayan granites. And to, to some degree, um, the Beaumont model subsequently uh, uh, att attempted the same sort of thing. Okay? So here's the model problems, it really isn't very elegant. We have to say, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. And the, the, you know, the argument would be, well, you know, I, I'm not describing every granite orogenic belt in the world. In fact, as I said, I challenged you guys earlier to think about of another collisional region that had paired liquid granite belts, you know, 60, 80 kilometers apart, and I don't think you've thought of one. So the truth is, this only ever has to have happened once in the history of, of the galaxy. And, uh, and, and so I don't really see that as a, as a killer, but uh, um, it does require, we have about 200 bars of shear stress. I don't know, Greg, you're gonna give that to me at 750, I've got the seal of approval. Okay, and as you'll see shortly, a duplex model actually better explains uh, the, uh, the thermochronology in detail. Okay, now, Who, who, would, who would be prepared to spontaneously define it? It's like you're wrong. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, in fact, it, it's, the cartoon shows it well here. Imagine you've got three rock packages, red, green, and blue. And what's happened, you know, it, rather than, well, in fact, let's start from, let's make this thing as simple as possible. Here's the Himalaya. Can we explain the distribution of ages, thermochronology, as a result of simply we come up over a ramp because, as Wang Ping may show you next week, uh, we do we see this sort of flat ramp, flat geometry under the Himalaya. Okay, or do we do what I've just proposed in the previous slide, and that is, uh, you know, have the MCT develop and then, in fact, break back uh, towards the hinterland and out of sequence thrust, or, in fact, is this a question of actually accreting material from the footwall in a series of so-called horses? Okay, so that this one comes first and then this guy, and then this guy. So what I've said is, uh, yeah, uh, we can explain this by uh, out of sequence thrust and then you know, substantial uh, shearing across a narrow zone. But you know, frankly, you bet substantial shearing across a narrow zone too. Only it had a temporal progression that wasn't implied in, in the earlier model. So now, now correctly define a duplex. No, I'm not <laughs> <laughs> no, this is not really this point. So this this shows the kind of the general principle of all thrust belts, and that's they form from the inside out. So the old stuff is usually in the middle of the range, and the younger stuff is in the front. And then it, it's called out of sequence thrust because it's behind the main frontal thrust. And this these things happen all the time, so it's not what Mark's suggesting is not unusual. And then these duplex things are, you know, a duplex is Right, so you could have motion on this as well as this and this. See all of these things forming. 
OK, this, I'm, 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 I'm sorry to sort of have, I should have warned you to get your eyes ready for the, the glare of white. Um, <clears throat> but this is a, actually a study in progress. We're just wrapping up. And, 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 I, and it occurs to me that this is a perfect way to um, uh, show you what the state of the art is instead of sort of the, the historical perspective you've been given. Uh, the, you know, so the couple of questions are, what, what, what's how best to describe the, uh, the structural evolution of the, uh, of the uh, thrust bar belt? And as I say, this is sort of caught on like wildfire too, which is, oh, you know, uh, is, uh, you know was the rainfall here uh, responsible for the you know, first order uh, uh, structural ev evolution of the, the Himalaya? Here's a more recent version, uh, Hodges, that's suggesting, in fact, that there, you, know, you, you, you produce the uh, high Himalayan granites and the North Himalayan granites by essentially these channelized flows popping out and localizing rainfall in different uh, positions at, at different times. So this is a study that uh, addresses both questions. We're going to go just to the east of Mount Everest. Here's Everest. Here's the Arun Valley, an amazing feature, this extraordinary a uh, structural uh, re relief over just tens of, uh, of kilometers here. And what we've done is we've collected samples up the Arun, some uh, vertical traverses as well, as I showed you the other day, and then measured these different thermochronometers, you guys. This is the Apatite uranium thorium helium uh, results, the uh, closure temperature, the nominal bulk closure temperature. Dave, give me a number. 50, 60 degrees, OK? So low temperature. Uh, now. now here's the uh, zircon. Give me a closure temperature. 110. OK. Um, and here's the, uh, the, 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 the Muscovite 4039. Uh, the appetite data looks great. This is work uh, done Ken Farley. This is a collaboration with uh, Itai Haviv and uh, Jean-Philippe Avouac at uh, Caltech. And uh, <coughs> but the Muscovite data a little puzzling in that you can see sort of this general trend. You think, well, you know, wh why would you have, why in this, uh, in this thrust system would you have a distribution of ages that go from old to young to, to old? And, uh, and, and particularly, what's the, what's the story here? What's the story here? Yes, yeah, sorry. This is, the, this is the average topography along, uh, up the section. Uh, this is the high, that's Mount Everest. That's the highest and that's the lowest in the valley. So here's the, here's the mean elevation, the local low, and the local, uh, the local high. Yep. So you're getting the samples that are below the lowest thing by just moving along the slope or something? To... Yeah, we're, we're basically walking up the valley and picking up samples. But we have actually then gone up the ridges and sampled. Uh, no, no, no. This is this is this this is this is elevation on this axis, and this is age on this axis. Yeah. So that's the valley bottom. That's the the local ridge, and this is the average uh, topography across this swath. Okay. So let's say that this minimum here, and to some degree defined here, and uh, you know unable, because what happens here? You hit carbonate, and there's no muscovite. Okay. So we'll call this a sort of the apparent highest erosion, or at least material that appear to have been brought up from the greatest depth most recently, because the ages are, are young. Uh, yeah. Uh, or there's you know, intercalations that, uh, that, uh, that have appetite in them. Um, uh, and also, you, know, you can get appetites from quartzites. Sorry, it's carbonates and quartzites, but you're unlikely to get muscovite. Uh, okay, so, uh, and then we'll call this sort of the transition zone where we see this funny hump in the, uh, in the Muscovite data. Now, uh, you know, beware the multicolored block diagrams. I finished talking about thermochronology the other day and saying, uh, you know, we've sort of, we've arrived at a point in thermochronology where, you know, we have, we have some skeletons rattling in the closet, uh, but people forget about them as soon as the multicolored <laughs> Uh, uh, a contour uh, plots come out uh, because you know buried in here are uncertainties about you know I mean uh, uh, the, uh, the the kinetics of helium and apatite or argon and muscovite and so on. Okay, but so on this face here, what you're looking at is a, a temperature history with uh, a pretty uh, I think uh, you know uh, we've we 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 we've decided we know from geodesy that there's 20 millimeters a year of convergence across the Himalaya. 
happening right now. Okay? And we can best model when we partition it to basically the lower plate moving at 15 millimeters a year and the upper plate uh, at, uh, at 5 millimeters a year. Um, and I uh, wouldn't worry too much about this. On, on this surface here, we're looking at, in this case, apatite helium age. And you can see what's going to happen with this sort of flat ramp, flat geometry, is we're going to bring hot material, so we're going to basically degas the helium in the apatite. It's going to come up, so we're going to, in fact, have the youngest ages uh, adjacent to the ramp. But now it takes some time to get from that uh, break in slope there out to the, uh, to the uh, trace of the thrust. And you actually can grow in some, some helium as, as, as a consequence. So this is a thermal model used. It's P-cubed, John Bronze. You can get this from his uh, website. He's currently at Grenoble. And this has been an increasingly uh, utilized and valuable resource for, for people looking to understand uh, landscape evolution from, uh, from thermocological data. So it's uh, essentially, um, he's, you know, it's got the diffusion equation in here, um, but it's essentially, like I said earlier, thermokinematic uh, model. You prescribe the fault uh, geometry and then uh, progress and see what happens in your forward models. The results, though, pretty pretty. Here's the uh, appetite data, and here's the here's the swath of successful uh, uh, model runs. Um, so, using that thermal model, you actually can predict the form of the appetite data pretty well. The zircon data is a little sketchier. Oh, and here's the sort of the relative uplift and erosion from that. Um, here's the. Uh, the uh, appetite data, the zircon data, and here's the muscovite data, which actually reasonably well defines the lower bound. But what's this thing here? We think this is, in fact, evidence of that uh, duplex formation, that uh, as a result of this sort of structural evolution, you, in fact, locally will see um, uh, older, colder, and in some cases, completely unreset ages. If I were actually to show you the whole database, I think you'd be, you'd be reasonably uh, uh, convinced. Uh, his is interesting. Is exhumation correlated with monsoon precipitation? It's fascinating. Here's uh, from the uh, satellite imagery. Here's the rainfall. Here's the essentially the main boundary thrust. This is the the uh, um, the the, uh, the the southernmost uh, range front. Here's the crest of the high, or sorry, here's the rainfall on the slope of the the high Himalaya. The region, the zone of apparent maximum erosion rates, doesn't actually correspond to the highest precipitation. In fact, it doesn't. It does correspond to the region with the greatest uh, stream power, the steepest slopes. So whatever water there is there has got uh, you know, greater scouring potential than, than, than down here. Uh, this includes snowfall once the snow melts. Yeah. But this is mostly, this is, uh, this is um, um, yeah, yeah, this is the uh, this is the spaceborne measurement looking at um, at uh, uh, imaging precipitation. So, so uh, how do you get stream power? Uh, uh, you know, uh, it's you have to basically create a landscape model of the uh, slope. Yeah, so these, so, so uh, that's right. So Itai has, has made these uh, observations and measurements and you know, what the size of the basins are and the relative slope. Yeah, there's, I think there's five parameters in the, uh, the stream power equation. And it's obviously, it's an empirical uh, um, uh, basis. But the, the, point, the point really is mostly that the youngest ages don't correspond to the, uh, to the highest rainfall. So in effect, but, but the the, the, uh, but it does correspond with the hill slope gradient. So essentially, if tectonics can push you up, then even though that ain't where it's raining the most, that's what's most important about washing the material out to the, to the Bay of Bengal. OK, so yeah, this is just a different, yeah, this now just shows the, the, uh, the, the data superimposed on there. I think, um, I think I don't have time. I got two minutes, and I don't really have time to, uh, to um, to give you this last uh, module. So I'm going to skip right through this and go to, ooh, this is tempting. Um, <laughs> as, as you're contemplating, how, how would the Beaumont model fit with the thermal, thermal data? 
Um, Yeah, the, the Beaumont model actually does a pretty good job of the thermochronology, although, uh, you know, it, if you don't, I mean, you know, our model actually fits the, the, the geochronology pretty well. Um, so I'm going to conclude, actually, that, um, that, uh, that in fact, it's a combination of out-of-sequence and duplex formation because the, um, the duplex formation fits the, uh, the low-temperature thermochronology very well but it doesn't fit the high temperature. It doesn't fit the, remember I showed you how these young ages, three, four, five, six million years, uh, you know, in the uh, uh, thorium-led uh, monazite inclusions in the garnets. So, um, so uh, the, di the, different, uh, the different thermochronometers are telling you about different parts of the, uh, the evolution of the, uh. so yeah, let's just skip over here. So here are these four different kinds of Himalayan models. The models that infer or assume that there's a temporal relationship between the uh, inverted metamorphism and the, the granite formation and slip on the MCT, they're just not tenable. That's absolutely clear that that was a terrible red herring that nature produced to distract us for you know, tens of years. Uh, the best explanation is this episodic magnetism. You can take my model or you know, maybe a better one will come along. Because uh, as I say, mine's a little Rube Goldbergy in the sense that I require a very specific history in order to generate it. But um, well, pardon me. <laughs> you know, right? It, this this only has to happen once in the last quarter of Earth history. Um, uh, the the idea of of uh, sort of the uh, pure distributed shortening, you know, you bang in and then propagate north. That's really not uh, tenable. Uh, certainly, the extrusion of Indochina, I think, is a geophysical fact. Um, uh, I'm not sure everybody does, but, um, uh, but the fact there is now, and I didn't focus on this much because it's, it's still in its early phases of people being able to go and by paleobotanical or by stable isotope methods estimate paleoelevation. This is, you know, this is, it's like what Samuel Johnson said about dogs standing on their hind legs. It's not that it is done well, it is that it is done at all. It's uh, worth, uh, worth uh, applauding. Um, uh, we've, we know, uh, although there's a, a substantial um, you know, uh, uh, activity or substantial uh, work being done uh, with the assumption that precipitation localizes uh, a deformation, we, d we don't in this study. I just showed you see that. And uh, the channel flow uh, model, I mean, I'm not saying that I don't believe that the lower and middle crust can be weak and can flow. Uh, I think there's no evidence that, it, that such partially molten, low viscosity material flowed into the Himalaya to, to, to be in place as the greater homolic crystalline. So that's that. Thanks. So I let you guys off about 10 minutes uh, earlier the other day. So you know, you got five minutes of questions. I think we could, we could eat into the coffee break. I'm just wondering, in your summary slide, what would you put there about the climate tectonics relation? Like, what would your, do you buy the models? What would you put as your just summary about the Oh, it's, it's early days, but this sort of, you know, I mean, the ruin may be the only valley in the Himalaya that, in which precipitation isn't, you know, doesn't drive where the, uh, the you know, the faults. So, you know, in a sense, I think, what does they say? Does, you know, does, you know, it, it sort of is tectonics the master to sort of the, it di dictate where you're going to have the steep front and there where the precipitation will drop, or does the rain suck the rocks out of the ground? Uh, and so my inference here is that it's the former, that the tectonics is the master and rain is the slave. Um, yeah, that uh, we thought we knew more about that uh, a dozen years ago than we do now. Um, uh, there's a few lines of evidence, one of which is if you look at the, the dirt, if you look at the paleosols in the foothills of the Himalaya, uh, you can see there's a really, there's a dramatic, um, you know, it's a real big signal. If this is del uh, carbon-13 and this is time, here's present day and here's, let's say, 10 million years ago. Um, the, the soil at about seven and a half million years, OK, 
Okay. It ain't that pretty, but it's not too different. At about seven and a half million years, basically what happens is you have this transition between so-called C3 and C4 plants. Grasses start to run wild. Okay. And so the, the argument, <laughs> green, sorry. <laughs> okay, you get the idea. It's, uh, you know, very negative, you know, minus uh, 12, 15, del C13, and it comes up to, you know, close to, to, to zero. Uh, so the argument was that, in fact, uh, you know, it, um, it basically, uh, the monsoon developed, say, seven, seven, eight million years ago, and what happens, you know, you may have noticed, you, I live in Los Angeles. Trees don't like it when it only rains two months a year, okay? Grasses, yeah, you know, they're, 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 this is cool. So, uh, in fact, what you're seeing is that uh, this was sort of forest dominated and then overnight. Uh, so it was sort of, uh, and then at the time I showed you the Nencheng Teng Law model the other day. Remember that normal fault? It was part of Tibet falling apart. You gotta make Tibet go up before it can fall apart sideways. What do we get? We got an eight million year age for that. Okay, so it's getting sort of tempting. Well, maybe uh, the mantle lithosphere detached eight million years ago, and uh, you know, it'd be like you know, you're out fishing and you've got a, a sinker on your on your bob, and somebody comes and cuts the sinker. What's it going to do? It's going to bob high in the water. And if you lost the the the, the dense mantle uh, lithosphere under Tibet, did it in fact uh, sort of instantaneously rebound? So this looked good for a while, and it just, it's, just, it's, not that, uh, it's not that that couldn't have happened, but uh, the evidence that's been generated in the last dozen years or so, it's, it's sort of, some of it supports it, some of it's contradictory. So, uh, you know, that's a long-winded way of saying um, we, we're not really there yet. Yeah? And just two questions for about your art of the transporting and business model. Uh, the first one is, um, do you think then that the source Tibetan detachment is not related to the gravitational collapse of the Tibetan plateau? Because uh, in your model, if I understand well, you could just create the source Tibetan detachment just when you stack enough slice first. And the second one is, does this model will fit also the three-dimensional structure of the greater Himalayan seconds? Okay, okay, well, let's do the first question first and then uh, uh, do I think that the STD, um, yeah, no, the, the zeroth order, you know, it's it, at some level reflects the, uh, you know, the, uh, the collapse of uh, the, uh, the high stand. But um, if I were to have had another slide that says current trends in Himalayan geology, it's that in fact, uh, you know, close colleagues and uh, this uh, sort of is spreading are now seeing, um, we're now seeing a much more complicated uh, evolution. In fact, we were talking about duplexes earlier, that uh, in the west and in the east of the Himalaya, which are the two regions that, that uh, were less studied, the Nepali Himalaya for a long time was the, the focus, uh, actually can, can, can point in the field to uh, uh, evidence, preserved evidence that the STD, in fact, is a passive root thrust. Okay, so that in fact, it, it isn't, it isn't quite as simple as rock go up, rock fall down. Uh, that the structural evolution may, in fact, be much more, uh, much more nuanced. So, uh, yeah, uh, that's 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 where it stands. And uh, I say, you know, I, 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 well, I obviously I didn't have time to bring that up, but th th this is really uh, the uh, one of the more exciting current debates. The second question. Yes, yeah, second question was um, so if you consider as your model in three-dimensional model, do you think that it will fit, for example, the um, uh, par orogen paralineations you observe in the literary by seconds when you see the kind of uh, east-west uh, extension of the uh, high gray box? Not sure I'm following. So you mean so th this is in, this is in, you know, so the, our thermal kinematic model, not, not the P-cube model. <coughs> Does it predict the lineations that we actually see? Um, the lineations are basically down dip until you get towards the STD. And maybe you are aware of this in the, because this is a French observation. Uh, that as you get towards the STD, they actually rotate from being uh, down dip 
they rotate into the STD, suggesting that there's some uh, transcurrent motion on, on, on that. But uh, uh, no, I mean, uh, you know, ours is not a uh, thermomechanical model. We, we basically say, okay, you know, now you will move south at five centimeters per year and then, and then go up. So there'd be, you know, there'd be no, no physics to be inferred from it just because we told it to do that. So that, that actually, okay, thanks. Emily. Oh yeah, oh absolutely. No, I mean the, the, the problem is, you know, is finding one that isn't. Uh, the the you know as I say, the solubility of zircon or monazite in a perluminous melt is very low. It's something I mean, at 700 degrees, you can saturate uh, a leucogranite melt uh, with 30 ppm zirconium. You know, the average concentration in the crust is maybe 200 ppm or something. So basically, you know, what you really expect is you know, to find uh, an inherited core with a little neoformed rim on it. And this was the problem, is that you take that combination and, uh, and date it, you're going to get an age, seeming age of 300 million years or 90 million years. This is what you need to do to date the time of granite formation. So, yeah, so lots of inheritance. Well, is there lots volumetrically, There's socionitic? Lot, <laughs> this is this is yeah. Look, okay, this is really no, no. This is a great, uh, great question because let me go back a couple of slides here to Tibet. Yeah. So yeah, we see socionitic uh, volcanism here. We see it here. We see it. Okay. But what's weird is being collision. Let's you know, let's say collision began at 55 million years, and frankly. At that point, I think you're almost at sort of two sigma of Himalayan geologists are on board, okay? 55 plus or minus three or something like that. Um, except this big part of the baffles right here, all these, oh, this thing right here, all that, that uh, that's 40 million years old. And uh, this one over here, that's 30 million years old. And uh, up in the Ninchang Tengla, um, as I showed you, it goes 20, 15, 10. I showed you age of eight. And these are, these are calcalkaline magmas. So what's going on? We've banged India in. I think, you know, Wang Ping will show you this, but I mean, the, the sort of the consensus among seismologists is that the this Indian crust is as far north as the Bangong New Jordan suture here. So you've got this cold, thick Indian crustal, uh, crustal lithosphere shoved halfway through Tibet, and yet we have continuous calcalkaline magmatism virtually to the present day. What's going on? I don't know. Um, so, you know, so the Shoshanites, that's frankly, ah, all you need is a little crack to the mantle. You know, you know a little oblique convergence, crack, low, you know. No, 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 the, Sh well, the, Sh well, the Shoshanites, no, Shoshanites can be, you know, um, it depends where you are, but they can be 20 million years old. They can be 15. They can be eight. Yeah, but I mean, volumetrically, they're you know, they're not. Yeah, but you know, how did you make that 15 million years after hard collision? That's weird. So anyway, so if, if this is a good way to end, because frankly, uh, it just underscores the fact that you know, we came to this 20 years ago. 20, 25, 20, you know, geologically unexplored. If you look at the problems I've talked to you about in the Himalaya, you'll notice that these are issues in which we're addressing at a very high level. It's, you know, we have an immense amount of data. There's observations. The, the isograds that the English were mapping 100 years ago are basically the isograds the French mapped in the, in the 60s and 70s. So we know a lot about the distribution of rocks and isograds and things like this, and it was just waiting for the advent, of, frankly, of the iron probe to be able to date monazite inclusions and garnets, to be able to date the rims on perluminous uh, accessory minerals. And whereas Tibet, one day my colleague and I made a wrong turn and we discovered a crustal scale thrust system that had never been you know, documented. Uh, it's on the Chinese uh, geological map as an unconformity. <laughs> okay? So Tibet was, is about you know, stumbling and making you know, a big scale discovery because it's so little of it. I mean, we thought, oh, there's 
there's rhodites everywhere. It's, you know, so it was all underwater. Whereas the Himalaya, we knew the distribution, we've known the distribution of rocks for 100, 100 years. We're just trying to figure out now these terms, is a duplex better than an out of sequence and things like that. In Tibet, it's the Wild West. So, you know, it, you know it, it attracts a lot of attention, but, you know, there's, there's plenty of opportunity. You guys have any interest in this. This is really, uh, this is really the place to be. Okay, I think I'd better uh, release you. Good.